Today we're going to talk about becoming a BlueWorks Live badass. Um, Julie didn't really want to use this uh, title because Julie's a nice person, but I thought that this was really the only way of saying it. If you want to set up an enterprise grade BlueWorks Live implementation, you have to be a badass. Uh, so we're going to go through a couple parts. What is BlueWorks Live? How to set up an enterprise grade uh, implementation of it? it. Wasn't really designed for that in the beginning, but it's becoming more conducive to that. And then Julie's going to take us through how to actually implement, or I'm sorry, how to design processes for better implementation. So I'm going to go through the first section, which is the account and library best practices. So we're going to start with accounts, libraries, spaces, subspaces, oh my. Um, there are a lot of different layers of BlueWorks Live. If you know BlueWorks Live, you know that it is a filing cabinet, essentially. So I think of BlueWorks Live as a filing cabinet that you actually can put your files into. So BlueWorks Live, your account, is the um, cabinet room, the room that the cabinet's in. The library is the actual filing cabinet. And then inside that cabinet, all those folders are your spaces. All of the artifacts are stored in those folders. It's the best way of explaining it. Um, it's very complicated. What happens when you have a giant library? Only the admin user can see everything. All the other users, they can see what their group has access to, what they have access to, the spaces that they have access to, and the artifacts that they have access to. So they don't actually have to see everything. So let's talk about spaces and space organization. I like to say, give me some space, because people like to have sandboxes, which is actually my last point, but I'll hit it first. Sandboxes are essentially places that people can play. People can do whatever they want in a sandbox. My best practice is to give people a sandbox that they can play in. Let them go, let them have fun in there. You'll be able to see in the glossary things that they create in that sandbox and delete them quickly. So when you're going in and creating spaces, you want to create it in a framework of some sort. Um, BP3 suggests three different ways of creating your spaces, either using the APQ, APQC framework, which you can actually find on BlueWorks Live uh, in the templates library. You can use your enterprise organization. So you know your HR department has a section, your finance department has a space, um, developers have a space, or you can organize it by projects. When I was working with BlueWorks Live, the majority of customers that I would see would actually organize it by project to start, move eventually to enterprise organization, and then discover that the APQC was the way that you wanted to go. Always have a set of library administrators and rules around being a library administrator. Um, who's allowed to move spaces? Who's allowed to make someone a space manager? Who's allowed to essentially uh, create better library practices? And who's allowed to write those? So the next point is naming. This is really important when you're creating your library structure and creating your spaces. Um, it's also really important when you're creating your artifacts makes the library actually easier to sort and file through. So the top example is if you're using an APQC um, style space organization, you would want to number and name the artifacts that fall within that space. The bottom one is if you're using um, a project organization, you will want to put the project name, the details of that project, and maybe who's working on it, things like that. Tagging is very important also. It becomes more important when you're trying to search through tags and you realize very quickly that um, finding the draft tag or finding the production tag uh, is the easiest way to discover what's supposed to be used. We'll start with some rules. Glossary terms should be singular. Uh, when you're, let's say, giving a user a, um, a term, it should be the user's role, not the user. So I don't want to say that Julie does this. I want to say that the BPMA does this. Um, and you should not abbreviate. You should always have a glossary manager, so somebody who is in charge of managing the glossary, so that they can go through and actually choose the terms, uh, merge the terms, add descriptions to the terms. Um, the screenshot on here is the where used. I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but when you're in the glossary, you can actually click a little button next to the word and find out where that term is used. It becomes really important when you have things like account manager. It's broadly used. You can see how many spaces, how many processes, um, and how many occurrences. User management can get really big in really big organizations. Um, 
you want to have you want to manage who is inviting new users. There is a feature of LDAP auto provisioning. So if you have the integration with your LDAP, you can actually auto provision new users to your account um, on a limited basis. You should create user groups. Use the user groups as much as you can. They are the people who you can allocate to spaces. You can quickly allocate new large groups of people to spaces. Um, and make sure that every space has a space manager and a user group manager. So they're removing people that don't need to be in that user, or I'm sorry, they're removing people that don't need to be in that space anymore, and they're removing users that don't need to be in the user group anymore. Okay, um, so before I dive into some of the process modeling best practices, I wanted to just cover some process modeling basics. What is process modeling? Um, basically, the process model is really the foundation for your BPM projects. Whether your goals with BPM are process visibility, process control, or full process automation, you're really going to need a process model that accurately reflects the flow of activities in your process and can communicate that to both, both the business and the technology groups. Um, so where do you begin? It looks like a lot of you have been using BlueWorks Live for a while, and say you want to get in there and start applying some of your best practices. So a good place to start is to call up some of your diagrams, zoom out, and take a look at what you've got. And really, the overarching goal here is, like I said, to communicate. You want to be able to talk through the end-to-end -end in about seven minutes or less. So some of the guiding principles to help get you there are the rule of seven, a fairly common one. Some of you may have heard of that. Um, basically, that states that you don't want to have any more than seven elements <laughs> visible at any one time per process level. And by elements, I mean that's mostly activities, but it also includes gateways and events, which we'll talk about in more detail, too. The next one there, you really want to avoid the string of pearl and constellation patterns. And as you can see in this diagram, we've got quite a few of those. There's those long strings of activities in the same swim lane. Um, so what you're going to want to do instead is to use sub-processes to capture that detail. Um, you put a lot of work into this diagram. You've got a lot of information there that you've captured, and you don't want to lose that. You want to keep that information that you took the time to get, but the best way to capture that is to put it into a sub-process so the user can get a good idea of the overarching process and then drill down and look at the details when they're ready to. Um, a couple other things that will make the diagram more readable is to use color coding to categorize your activities. Um, there's not really an industry standard on color coding, like what colors mean what. <laughs> um, but BlueWorks Live has a pretty good um, color system that you can use. And when you have a BlueWorks Live program at your company, it's good to be consistent with how you use that. Um, another good thing to improve the readability is to place the process um, participants, the swim lanes in order of appearance, so to speak, so that the first participant has the activity up in the upper left corner. Uh, milestones in BlueWorks Live are depicted as vertical swim lanes. They're basically those columns that you see. Um, milestones should represent major, major phases of a process. You really shouldn't have more than four or five in your process diagram. And you can see in this case, we've got 10 or 11. Um, so in a case like this, you definitely want to consolidate and reduce the number of milestones there that you see. Uh, milestones should be written in noun form. And that's not just for grammar. <laughs> um, it's actually, by writing it as a noun, it helps keep it more at a conceptual level to capture what's happening in that phase. If it's written as a verb, chances are you're being too granular and listing out a specific activity within a milestone. So keep it written as a noun. As you're trying to reduce your milestones, one area where you can focus is where you've got rework loops crossing milestones. Um, you don't want to have lines that go all the way across. And as you can see in this flow, we've got some that stretch about four or five milestones. So that's kind of a good area to focus and say, OK, maybe I can condense that a little bit better. Then we can move on to activities. Activities are really the bread and butter of your process diagram. And that's where most of the um, best practices apply to. And if you can reduce a lot of those and condense them into sub-processes, that's a really good, important place to start. Activities in BlueWorks Live are represented as a simple rectangle, and they represent a task or the smallest unit of work in a process diagram that a participant will do. That can be a user or a system. Um, activities, unlike milestones, should use a verb-noun form. And again, that's not just for grammar. 
it's really important to know what action is happening during that activity and what's being acted upon. Um, and another important thing, the last bullet up here, this is really critical, especially if you're planning to implement your process into a BPM system. Um, you can remove a lot of activities that are what we call implied steps. Um, gateways are another area that uh, can sometimes cause issues in process models. Um, there's two main categories of gateways within BlueWorks Live, parallel and decision. Um, parallel gateways represent a point in the process where it's going to split and then both paths happen simultaneously and both paths always happen until it merges again. That's different from decision gateways where only one path or another is taken. One um, habit that we sometimes see is for people to string multiple gateways together. Like if it's a loan application, for example, you might have a gateway that says, is the applicant a high credit risk, yes or no? And if yes, it moves to another gateway. Like, are they 25 and older? And then if yes, that moves to another gateway. And pretty soon you have a long chain of gateways. And that's really not the best practice for implementing gateways. What you should do instead is to precede that gateway with an activity where you embed all the decision logic and decision rules. Um, another really important thing about BlueWorks Live, and to me what sets it apart from tools like Visio, which are just flat uh, diagrams, is the ability to add process details. Um, any event that you double click on, BlueWorks Live will open up a screen to let you input so many details, everything from the system being used, to cycle time, uh, problems, risks, it's all the SIPOC data, all that should be entered. Your process model really isn't complete until you've entered those process diagram or process details. Um, the documentation I just want to call out is another really good place which can help you reduce some of the activities, the number of activities that you have. If you've got a lot of really granular activities where you're writing out almost workflow level steps, one tip is that you can use that documentation field to kind of list out almost like a user manual for how to do uh, that particular activity. So I'd just like to share a couple best practices. Uh, before you even start modeling, it's really important to understand the placement of that process at the organization and within the value stream. Understand its inputs, understand its impacts, understand the purpose of why that process even exists. And as an analyst, when you're capturing the current state, you're gonna be interviewing a lot of process participants. And so one tip I wanna share is to always do your homework before meeting with them. Research any documentation you can find on that process, look through BlueWorks Live, look through the library, I'll learn everything that you can before you go into that meeting. I've also found it's helpful to meet with process participants individually rather than trying to you know, pull the whole group into a meeting and build the process from scratch in BlueWorks Live. You can do that, but it's better, I've found, to meet with each participant first. That way they have a voice, they can tell you exactly what they do. You, can, you won't be blindsided during that big meeting if you've done some work ahead of time. Um, another really good practice is to observe an actual instance of a process, like if an application comes in, uh, sit with that person for a while, see what they do, then follow that application along, the whole process. So you're looking at a real instance. Um, capture any cycle times that you see, capture any inefficiencies, make notes of all that. And then build it out in BlueWorks Live as you go along. As soon as you finish that meeting, just brain dump everything you've learned right into BlueWorks Live and be sure to capture all those details that we talked about. And finally, at the end, then, that's a good time to bring everyone together and validate what you learned and gain consensus. One thing we wanted to share, um, for your future state, there's kind of a checklist that I like to run through in my mind, um, especially before you move it over to the implementation phase, um, just to make sure you've kind of covered your bases. Um, so the first and foremost, have you applied all those best practices? Have you moved the, removed those implied steps? Um, have you removed any superfluous activities? Um, that was one feature I forgot to mention too. BlueWorks Live has a value add or non-value add um, way to tag activities. And using that can really help you decide what activities could potentially be removed. And that should be done during that process analysis uh, phase that I had mentioned. Um, can any flows be done in parallel? 
this is a good way that you could potentially cut your whole cycle time. If there's any paths that can be done at the same time, be sure to think through that. And be sure to use that plus sign <laughs> when you do a parallel flow. Um, can you leverage any pre-existing linked sub-processes? Um, that's where a well-organized BlueWorks Live library can really come into play and be effective. You can see if there's anything out there that's already been done, and you can just plug in uh, to that linked sub-process rather than duplicating the work. Um, and are the high priority pain points being addressed? And think back to when you were meeting with those participants and you saw all their pain. Is the future state addressing that? Is it really helping? Um, so that's one key thing to ask yourself as you're going along. And finally, have the right people been engaged? Um, it's so important to have the actual users to have talked to them and really understand the flow from their perspective. And it's also under important to have technical people there so they can tell you what's possible and you're not making promises that you can't keep. Um, and decision makers, more high level management level people who really have uh, some metrics and things that they wanted, want to have put into the future state, that's important to capture too. Um, and finally, a good question to ask yourself as you're doing it, can all those people in the room articulate the value that's being gained from the future state? And can they do it quickly? It's the kind of thing where if you're walking down the hall and someone says, hey, how about that BPM project? What's, what are we going to get by doing that? You want everybody to be able to quickly, quickly say, here's what we're going to get. Here's the value.